Oh, I love your background, Melvin. Oh, <laughs> how are you guys? Doing all nice right. I love you. that. That's cool. So the the um, I, I think we'll start in just a second. The background is um, the concert hall at Norfolk, oh. where we're going to oh. do your piece this summer, Daniel. <laughs> Yay! It's uh it's it's in the northwest Connecticut, but the wood was shipped out. It's California redwood shipped by train in 1900 from California. <laughs> wow. So that's amazing. All right, should we should we get started? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, Whenever you wish. I think Daniel it might yep. be I don't know if he can hear. No, he can't hear us. Yeah, okay. I, can hear I wasn't sure. Yeah. All right. Um, so welcome, everyone, um, to the first in a series of conversations um, yeah. about the Musical Bridges Project. Uh, my name is Melvin Chen. I'm the director of the Norfolk Chamber Music Festival. Um, I'm really, really happy to have with us uh, two very important and busy people, uh, Daniel <laughs> Romain DBR and Afa Dorkin. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, it's it's a treat for me, and I know it's a treat. It's going to be a treat for the audience too. Um, so uh, let me do, before we start, I just want to uh, just briefly describe this commissioning project and and thank the uh, the donors. Um, yeah. This is a project, a multi year project um, that commissions works um, that build bridges between classical music and and other other things, other genres, other issues, um, and um, this this project is made possible through the generous support of the Desai Family Foundation. I know several members of the Desai family are watching, so thank you very much. The other thing I'd like to say is that uh, if any of you in the audience want to ask any questions, um, just type in the questions and we'll leave time uh, for questions at the end. Yeah. Um, so um, Daniel's obviously composer, artist and you i'm gonna i'm gonna show a video in a, a second um and afa is the president and artistic director of the uh, sphinx organization which is one of the most yeah. important um classical music organizations um dealing with diversity and we're going to talk more about that in a minute but um just to start i'd like to play this it's about a three and a half minute video um talking about daniel and his work. So let's see if I can handle the technical requirements needed to show the video. <laughs> nice. Okay, here we go. As an artist entrepreneur, I really am committed to creating projects that speak to social injustice, has something to say about racial and cultural identity, and in many ways, I'm trying to figure out how are we all going to live together? I have, throughout my career, worked with DJs, laptopists, iPadists, choreographers, dancers, spoken word artists. I've worked in film, television, in modern dance, ballet, and I'm always wanting to find out how I can learn and create something new. Yes. When I go into the classroom as an educator, I'm thinking about a conversation. I see education as one of those places where democracy really can happen and that all voices can and should be heard. Imagination, Imagination. allows me to do, allows me to do anything. anything. Woo! It will take more blood, more sweat. It will take faith over faith, strength over pain, pain over fear. It will take a village, a city to persevere. His mother on the sideline holding a family down. Important as artists, we are having a direct conversation with our personal audience. <laughs> Opera Philadelphia has invited me to create a new work, and I immediately turned to Mark Bermuthi Joseph to write the libretto, 
and the great Bill T. Jones to direct and choreograph the work. And we've been working on our new opera called We Shall Not Be Moved. It's an original work that explores the controversial and difficult aspects of racial inequity, social injustice, and the role of law enforcement in all of our lives. We Shall Not Be Moved, I hope, will be the kind of work that can help to heal not only the Philadelphia community, but all communities that are suffering and that look to the work of the artist as antidote. I think for me, love has to do with service and how I can serve any community. I want to do good, it's a simple thing. I want to do well and I want to be I want to be real. Okay. Wow. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, okay. A, a very hopeful and powerful message, Daniel. Thank you. No, thank you for showing it. It's, it's kind of you know strange to watch it. Uh, <laughs> so I want to I want to talk about how this the the commission of up for Norfolk and and just go through the history of it because to me it's actually like twenty years in the making. <laughs> you know, I think just for well, people you know who don't know, um, Daniel and I grew up in the same town of nashville tennessee and you went to high school with my brother <laughs> and and you you study who'd you study the violin with in nashville well with actually Chris? your 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 brother well, i was at vanderbilt oh you were at he, vanderbilt i was at vanderbilt yeah and he was taking lessons with chris teal so we had the same we all teacher. studied with the we all studied with the same teacher we all studied with the same teacher that's right so that's, <laughs> that's the story yeah i had just Gotten, I graduated from Dillard High School in uh, Fort Lauderdale, ah. and, and I was a first-year student, freshman at Vanderbilt, and I and I met your brother, yeah, er, Irwin. Oh, no. Irwin, yeah, 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 yeah. So then, fast forward a bunch of years, we won't say how many, but then <laughs> I remember running into you on yeah. the subway. Yep, in New York. <laughs> In New York. Quite literally. That's right. That's right. But that was that was like twenty years ago, right? And then yeah. what I remember our conversation on the subway because we said we both left the subway saying we should we gotta do something together. Yeah, and, and in between, of course, I had met Alpha at the University of Michigan, um, where I also studied uh, composition and uh Alpha and her amazing husband Aaron. Um we were all friends at the University of Michigan studying and Hoping and dreaming and raging. <laughs> it's a small, it's, it's a right. small world. <laughs> it's a very small world. Yeah. So, so the so that the original um, we had talked about this commission probably two years ago, right? Right. Yeah. And um, and I remember then because we it was it was uh, it was 2019 we talked and start to put this thing in motion and then obviously because of the pandemic we couldn't do it this summer but you right. you had you you what was your original idea for the piece? Ooh, well, um, along with Afa, I think that um, just to give a little con thirty second context yeah. here, when I was at Vanderbilt University. Um, the Blair String Quartet commissioned me, which was a big deal because I was a student. And this was the faculty quartet. <clears throat> and I remember John Kokonowski, who was the famed violist of the group, who was in um, the Rockburg String Quartet, among many others, did a lot of new music. Um, he said, um, you know, any commission is a choice. So I chose to write for that first string quartet, the X String Quartet for Malcolm X. And subsequent to that, now I've written all of my string quartets are about iconic figures from the civil rights era. When I was at the University of Michigan, I was also asked to write pieces. Um, one of them was hip hop essay for orchestra, another choice. And uh, working with Aaron and Afa, we both had these kind of lofty ideas that classical music could be um, in service to activist work, in service to changing um, one of the peculiar 
and damaging aspects of classical music, that's this kind of exclusionary practice, right? Um, so when when we decided, when you decided actually to bring me into the tradition of Norfolk, which has its own tradition, which is important. You know, I'm I'm in not I'm only a few miles away. I'm by the way, I'm in not in New York. I'm in Norwood, Massachusetts. When you asked me to write the piece, again, it was a choice. And the original choice was going to center on what I see as an American story of a man and a woman and their daughter wake up and they brush their teeth and they have breakfast and they get into a car and they're driving down the road and they're accosted by a law enforcement officer and words are exchanged, bullets fly. And what is different here is that this man, Philando Castiles, and his partner, she begins to record his death, daughter in the back seat. Um, we become a kind of, it's a kind of tragic, voyeuristic journey that is now a part of America's history. Maybe it's always been. And that was the original idea. And it's, I have to say that um, it's painful. Um, it, it takes a certain amount of, the, the, the connecting tissue here is that in each of these types of commission, it takes courage from the presenter, in this case, Norfolk Chamber Music Festival, to say, we hear you and we want to support you and understand your pain and your trauma and and um, I'll, I'll collaborate with you in a way that allows you to express the pain and trauma of a community. That was the original commission. Yeah. And and then um, obviously we had to uh, cancel the festival this summer because of the pandemic. Yeah. And and then you you had called me right right at the beginning of the summer and said. Uh, Look, let's. I, I still want to do this, but now I want to kind of broaden the scope of it. So, yeah, and I and I, and Alpha can speak to this. But I broaden the scope. This was before George, the the lynching and murder of George Ford of Floyd, right? When we started talking, what is duly um, unfortunate is this trope, this revolution, this repetition of a. I call it a kind of. Um, um, a, a tragic pas de deux between a law enforcement officer and a person of color. And this framing of death, right? So that's what I meant by, unfortunately for us, Melvin, there's going to be more names and more stories. And, that, and, it's, and it's, it is duly ironic that we were looking at a piece for the opera Philadelphia company when tonight Philadelphia is on fire. Right. Um, um, and I, I just wanted to say Afa, um, in your work, how do you deal with, with, uh, musicians of color, or I shouldn't say that BIPOC musicians, musicians who are coming from communities that are in crisis within a crisis, who want to perform classical music. How have you been? Yeah, I mean, that? I think I also off, I wanted to um, just have you talk about the Sphinx because I, I don't know if mm -hmm. everyone in our audience is familiar with what you and, and the important work you do. Absolutely, sure. So Sphinx is a national social justice organization whose mission is transforming lives through the power of diversity in the arts. So we see ourselves as an agent for social justice, but the avenue through which we build that attention or, or, or bring attention to the issue is through the performing arts with a heavy focus on classical music. Sphinx has been around for nearly a quarter of a century, and I'm, I'm pleased to say I've been a part of it in some shape or form from its very beginning, even when it was only a faint concept. Um, throughout the year, we our programming is built on a sense of a pipeline where we introduce classical music um, to young people ages seven and eight, and then onward, taking them through their journey through um, 
developmentally really all through uh, secondary school then onward to college development and then empowering careers and really trying to change the paradigm in the professional development and uh, arts leadership sense as well. We reach more than 10,000 people annually directly through our programming and our audiences are upwards of 2 million every year. Um, of course, with the catalyzing events of this past spring and summer, if anything, I think for me, it's been a really personal experience of recognizing the importance of standing up and listening, but also doing something about the fact that we still have to have a conversation about a tragic part of the day. I love the way you said it, um, Daniel. And, and the fact that, you know, 25 years ago when we were at Michigan and talking about things needing to be different and wouldn't it be what we were talking about a simple concept how amazing would it be if our stage our audience um our if if everywhere we looked simply looked like the the, the city in which we live or um just be reflective of the richness that's inherent in our communities um in some ways they can say our work has been so rewarding and there has been so much progress but in some other ways i can say we've got such a long way to go and in many ways um, some of the farther way to get ways to go have been more illuminated by um, the, the events and the dual pandemic. And I think at a time like ours, it's a privilege for me to be in the space that Sphinx is in because I get to hear firsthand the, the pain and the suffering and the reaction of BIPOC musicians and community members who are trying to do something and move the needle and change the narrative it's an interesting, Melvin, when you talk about classical music, um, in some of the, some of my personal kind of ethos and mission is getting to redefine what is classical music uh, and what is American classical music and how broad and rich and beautiful it is and what a privilege it is to be a part of that paradigm and how important it is for us to now recognize um, that there are volumes of works by BIPOC composers dating back to the Renaissance era. They are not difficult to find. <laughs> They're not hard to come by at all. There are plenty of resources out there, but it very much comes back to Daniel's assertion that every performance and every commission, every programming element is a choice. So for too long, we've made limiting and limited choices that are not informed by empathy that are not reflective of all of the richness that's inherent in our communities and that do not push forward the idea of equity and the idea of representation, the, the idea of justice and fairness. And um, the clock is and has been ticking. And um, I think I'm generally not a cynic and a rather optimistic person, but I have been telling my team, my colleagues, my friends, that the window of opportunity here to do something is closing. It's just ever so slightly ajar anymore. Um, the end of May was when we were mourning the death and the murder uh, of George Floyd. We are here almost six months later. Um, and what can we say has changed? Maybe the volume of conversation, maybe the breadth of the conversation, but it also has uncovered a lot of areas that still need healing and decisive action. So I'm more toward the decisive action and what better way than to empower our artists, our composers like Daniel and um, to partner with them honestly and make that choice um, to, tell, to tell a more just story. I mean, I have I have a bunch of topics I want to cover, but I think this one is um, interesting to me because it seems, you know, with all these events of the summer as one part of it, and then this kind of yeah. pandemic really impacting in a serious way so many arts organizations. You know that if if the Metropolitan Opera, the New York Philharmonic, the major, the you know, if if you know. Any of our, you know, there are students listening, if they got a job in one of those orchestras, you know, you would think they've made it, right? And yeah. and for those arts organizations to just shut down, you know, pay, you know, in the case of the Met, does not pay their musicians at all, right? It seems like um, this 
actually is a crisis point for the performing arts, but it's also an opportunity to come out of it uh, in a better way. It, you know, if we have to rebuild the, this this system that's you know collapsed because of the pandemic, you know, how would you how would you rebuild these institutions in a better way? Because I think we have, you know, yeah. now is the opportunity to do it, right? No one's playing. No one's, you know, hardly, there are hardly any concerts right now. Yeah, I, I mean, I, in some ways, it, yes, there are hardly any concerts. At the same time, it is totally a transformative moment, too. Maybe if we start building from the standpoint of access and broadly that access, and from a standpoint of building partnerships, what we don't have is right now, access to safe stages. We can't commune with our audiences in the way that we used to or in the way that we wish to. Sure, there are some very practical levels of limitation. It's not safe. Um, but there are ways to transition some and much of what we do. Um, and I think there's always a silver lining. I mean, I, I can say that from the standpoint of Sphinx, uh, we've taught you know 400 lessons since the pandemic started to young kids who don't have very much of anything. Um, and some of what we're teaching is a bit different. Some of what, of what we're teaching is the elements of American music history um, and, and how it's defined and how it's told by black and brown composers. That, that happens to be the focus of Sphinx. Um, in some other ways, you know, there are of course all these virtual events and performances, but for me, it was a personal intimate experience one I think no one on my team will ever forget. Uh, we put together a virtual gala involving 65 of our musicians and sure it takes different kinds of skill sets to listen and engineer a performance from everyone's bedroom but in other ways it, it also was extremely special to provide an avenue and just amplify the voices that have always been there and 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 I think the result of it, while much more complicated and, and entirely a different paradigm, you know, more than 15,000 people could hear that. When I'm at Carnegie Hall doing our gala, if we're lucky, it's 2,500 people. So I think some of it's, it's also an opportunity for classical music, for American classical music to be heard by more people and for it to, and for us to bridge that gap between humanity and understanding and this pedestal-like assignment that this art form has received some years, some centuries ago, and never has been able to come off of that. It's a way to humanize. It's a way for everyone to have an opinion about what classical music should be saying and whose voices we need to be amplifying. You know, I, I think uh, it also is a great opportunity. And, and I think for some, for composers like Daniel and others who are trying to help us narrate our reality, which is how I think our composers are our historians. They're the ones who record what happened so that our children and grandchildren can know about it and learn and study it. I think, you know, when we can't get an orchestra together, we, we should be reimagining and seeing if a quintet can do it. Honestly, I think it's a way for us to get out of the, um, the rigidity uh, that, that's been almost inseparable from our identity as classical music practitioners and, and see if we can think bigger than ourselves. That, that's a thought that I yeah, have. Yeah, thank, thanks, Safa. I agree. I, I, hmm. and, and, and what, do you, what do you think, Daniel? I remember, um, you know, when we talked over the summer, you know, we, I think both of, all of us have, you know, uh, musician friends who are suffering because, you know, they can't play. And I, and I imagine that, you know, that the musicians of color are actually, you know, much worse because they have to, yeah, they have always. to deal with the events and they have to deal. And, and you, <sighs> when I remember this summer, when I talked to you on the phone, you said, listen, I'm just giving money to my, to people that I know because yeah. they need it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That continues. Um, I'm doing that, you know, kind of, anonymously <laughs> and I'll continue to, but yeah, because, you know, I mean, I happen to land in an industry, in an industry that, um, that one of the industries that's not affected or, at, or as adversely affected is teaching. So because I'm proudly teaching at Arizona State University and I'm a, I'm a um, visiting scholar um, as part of, um, I'm a Roth uh, visiting scholar at Dartmouth um, College, I have um, 
I have support and income and health and health insurance and for myself and for my family, for my son. So I'm lucky. It, it wasn't a, a plan. And I've been teaching now for well over 10 years. Um, and at Arizona State University since 2015. But um, I think that were I not teaching, I would be um, at negative income. I'd be, I would not have health care. I'd be, um, I don't know, I'd be living off of what meager savings I have. And I'd be terrified. And I don't want to lose sight of that. Because I think, I think history and stories are important. And I think that, well, one way to move forward, one way to navigate uh, what I what I think are now five. I think I've I think I've I've identified five kind of overlapping crises is through partnership. So again, this partnership with with Norfolk um, and the history of this chamber music festival, which is long and storied. I mean, my understanding it's it's the oldest chamber music festival perhaps in the yeah, country. Right, right in the country. Right. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so my immediate question is. Am I the first black Haitian American composer to be commissioned by Norfolk? I don't know. And if I am, I hope I'm not, but if I am, there's even added weight and responsibility and opportunity to truly partner with not only the festival, but with its history. And, right. and, I, and I can say it this way because, you know, change is slow, <laughs> painful. Change is coming in the next, what, five days? We're on the precipice of major change in this country, one way or another, right? Um, I, I mean, I, those five changes, by the way, yes, we're in a pandemic. Yes, we are um, um, thinking about and having to think about climate change. Yes, our judicial system has changed just recently and will continue to, not only in terms of SCOTUS and the Supreme Court of the United States, but on a, on a federal level which in some ways is even more consequential, to tell you the truth. Um, we, we're on the precipice of a complete change in our economic structure, right? And um, I think we are, we are dealing with, with uh, obviously, well, with this pandemic, with COVID-19, and, and, and a healthcare strict um, system that is being fractured. And by the way, also may change. Right for mm -hmm. millions of, of Americans, lest we forget. So I think the first place to start is to try to navigate. Oh, I, I said the pandemic twice. What I meant was a fight for social justice. Sorry, lest we forget. With those five changes, I think one one place to begin is to to rethink partnerships and to rethink what are our partnerships to ourselves and our mental health. By the way. I'm always speaking to two audiences, right? My son is biracial. He lives between his two parents, right? So that means that if you are a white person, your relationship to your health is very different than my relationship to my health, right? So one, th one way to think about this is to start with partnerships. What is your relationship to your body? What is your relationship to your family and your community? And then what is your relationship of your community to the rest of the world. And that's a good way to call it scaffolding of ideas. That's a good place to start. That way, it, as Afa brilliantly talked about empathy, then I can think about Norfolk's history, not as a threat, but in some ways as commentary, commentary, and a way for me to become a part of that commentary. That becomes, I would say, hopeful. So if I am the first black Haitian American composer to be well, commissioned by Norfolk. Yes. That's you hard. are the you are the first black Haitian American composer to be commissioned. The oh, first okay. the first the black history. there was there was a black European composer that was commissioned ah, by Norfolk okay. in nineteen I don't know right. it must be nineteen fifteen or something. Sure. Sam, Norfolk commissioned Samuel Coleridge Taylor. To, oh, sure. Him out, oh, out, oh, yeah. Brought him out to Norfolk actually. Um, oh, yeah. And and celebrated some of, some of yeah. his yeah some of his pieces. So it's I mean it's. You you are yeah, I mean it is part of a very long musical history, yeah. um, and you'll be the the latest in that history, <laughs> which yeah. I'm you know I, I'm very proud of. Um, Absolutely. And I, and, and how, I'm I'm curious how, you know given all those crises, how do you see, mm. like when you think about your art and the pieces you write, how do you 
how do you fit your art into that? What do you try and what do you try to achieve? Is it, I, I, you know, I, it, yeah. it's more than just you know an outpouring of your feelings, right? It's it's mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. for sure. I mean, I know that from having listened to your music, but I'm curious yeah. how you kind of conceptualize that relationship. Well, uh, and I'll try to give shorter answers. I'm sorry, <laughs> get more questions. Succinctly, my music always starts with an idea. So I, I'm I'm I define myself. Well, first of all, my name is Daniel Bernard Rumain. That's the name I was given. And, and it's important for everyone listening, you know, it's important that you can declare your name, not just say your name. Then there's a comma. I'm a black Haitian American composer. So I'm old enough to have lived through being called an Afro American composer, African American composer, black composer, composer. You know, Frank Zappa's tombstone says two words, American composer. That had a big impact on me. He was defining himself at the end of his life. I decided to define myself at the beginning of mine. So I'm a black Haitian American composer. I define composing as the farming and framing of ideas. That's it. And I think we have to find ways, well, I would encourage anyone to find ways. How, how, do you, how can you define yourself succinctly in a way that is innovative, um, respectful, mindful, but authentic? Right. Black composer tells you one thing. Black Haitian American composer who farms and frames ideas tells you something else. So for me, often it's an idea that leads to a title that leads to the music. I, the most recent orchestral piece I just wrote was for the New Jersey Symphony Orchestra, and it's called in all lowercase letter, letters, I am a white person who blank black people. That's the title. And I did that because. I wanted to give the white musicians and the audiences an opportunity to literally fill in that blank. It's a blank. And it's a wonderful way, for example, for me to then, once I have the title, the music flows. Oftentimes they come at the same time, right? I mean, you, 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 anyone can do this. If I say, um, if I say, um, oh gosh, sorry. <laughs> Well, what, what first came to mind was pigeons on fire. And I realized, <laughs> let, me not, let me not go there. Let's, how about we say um, pigeons floating on pink clouds? There we go. Okay. That, right? I hear that. That's a very good pink clouds. Let's actually, let's edit. Pink clouds to me has a sound. Flute. Harmonics on the violin. No rhythm. Whole tones. Right? As opposed to um black boots marching oh that's a good title right there black boots marching you can hear that you can almost hear that right the whole orchestra down boss doom doom i mean so that's it's it's a visceral way of composing it's an immediate way of composing you know yeah does that make sense yeah no no that's cool that, that's why you're a composer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, th- I I think of all all three of us as, um, I mean, we are we're all educators, um, mm. in in you know many and different ways, and and um, you know I I, I work I, you know I think about this a lot because you know as teachers we we have students and and what you think about is. Um, you know how should they be educated uh especially going into you know a uncertain musical landscape right and mm. I, i'm just curious i've been thinking about this a lot uh, and i'm yeah. I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on it sure alpha do you want to i know you've dealing with this too sure so for me it, there there's a certain there's a certain reciprocity about teaching um, that I think makes it so fulfilling and that when we teach, we also learn a great deal and it's empowering. Um, so for me, I've been teaching in some shape or form for quite a long time, uh, but for the past five years, I've had the privilege of teaching as part of the master's program at Roosevelt University um, for their arts leadership program. So when COVID struck, I didn't get to make my annual trip to Chicago to teach my uh, graduate student cohort, which I typically do in early June. Um, So all of the teaching migrated to a virtual space. That wasn't in and of itself a particularly different task. I mean, you could could do that. And I have to say the cohort was a bunch of very brilliant people who were fairly brave and courageous. 
But I would say what we all got to experience is this sort of um, the transition and our, our ability to be agile and to rely upon each other for different things. I think when we, I mean, I teach a course in community engagement. So <laughs> one of the things we do is we, day, we do a day of immersion when we go, we pick, um, uh, we pick an arts institution in the Chicago land area and we go spend a day and look at, look under the hood, look every way possible to see how it's run. And we learn their values. We try to um, get backstage and see if we can fulfill some of these roles. It's one of the ways in which I try to um, talk with my students about community being anything that you want and you define it and any one person should have a multitude of communities and as such engaging it shouldn't be that complicated. Um, and we should by no means ever allow ourselves or those around us to say that community engagement is this tiny little office down the hall that just does all the stuff nobody else wants to do the way, you know, maybe orchestras of yesteryear would think about community engagement. Hopefully never again, not after George Floyd. Um, so, and here we were trying to reimagine that and see how's that gonna happen in the virtual space. And I think for me, the coolest thing was hearing from this cohort of um, something like 15 arts leaders, emerging arts leaders, talk about their communities and how they see it and what they wish they saw and ways in which they wish their communities represented them. Um, and, and it doesn't. And I mean, this is an international course. I had students from Moldova and, you know, South Side Chicago. So it was a really interesting dialogue. For me, it was probably one of the more fulfilling years of teaching because there were so many things that I would otherwise never get to learn about or hear about if not for letting, letting these emerging leaders talk about the most important things on their minds and how to reconcile that with the academic rigor of a master's degree and what they're gonna do once they get out. What, how is what they're learning consequential to their equipment to deal with the society, to be full-fledged members of the society after they get out and they have their, their piece of paper. What will they contribute? How will they continue to teach and learn? And to me, um, that's the privilege of teaching. It's also the joy of teaching. I learn as much from literally my students as I do from my own children who teach me all kinds of things all day, every day. Um, and, and really the youngest members of the Sphinx family who um, may need a little help curving their pinky, maybe on the bow, but know so much more about what it is that, that their community needs and how, how that's spoken and reflected through their voices, however young. Um, so I think the more we can think of teaching and learning as something that's a privilege for everyone and that we always have something yet more to learn and to teach. Um, I think we it would behoove all of us to like dabble in that space a bit. Absolutely. No, I mean, I, you know, as a teacher, I think we all learn as much as we hopefully give to the students for sure. Or more. Yeah. <laughs> or more. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> No, that's that's exactly right, um, Alpha. That's exactly right, um, Melvin. I I approach it very simply. I am I personally don't use the word teacher or student. I we refer to one another as contributors. We're all contributors to a classroom of to a classroom and a world of ideas. So that's in the syllabus on day one. Um, I'm always um, wanting to make teaching as equitable as possible. So do, even how I define education as a precise articulation of a life experience, mm -hmm. um, that's very important to me. That way it, it's not relegated or um, 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 that everyone who is alive has the possibility of um, expressing their life experience, right? In a, in a precise manner, uh, specific manner. And and then just as you were saying, I think I'm always wanting to, I see education as an investigation, constantly wanting to investigate um, every aspect of, of every day. Um, and, and that exchange of investigation 
are kind of my found, founding principles. And that translates well in this world. I, I'm also very conscious of words, very conscious of words. I think words have so much potential for um, well, good and harm. So for example, um, I once, last week I said to uh, somebody who was asking me, well, how, how, do, how do I teach in this, you know? Okay, I say, okay. Instead of having a rehearsal, an orchestral rehearsal, change that word. What, what word would you use other than rehearsal? Because any word you choose other than rehearsal is gonna change how you approach your time together, right? So that was interesting. And especially when you say to, and that's why I used to work contributors, because then when I, when you pose that question to contributors who are all, you know, involved in the class, then that becomes really, you know, exciting. Instead of rehearsal in the chat room, put one or two words that you would use in place of rehearsal. You got words like communion, conversation, <laughs> dance party, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and, and that's what's so exciting to me. It's like, the, you know, the minute we, we, Norfolk has a long tradition, which is wonderful, wonderful, and we can understand it, honor it, and investigate it. Even for us, right? If you couldn't use the word, because that's a thing, right? That's the brand. Norfolk, mm -hmm. even looking at mm -hmm. that right now, that font, the way that K kicks out, love it. That's, that's a choice. So now let's leave Norfolk, but if we weren't going to call it a music festival, see, we can do it right now. Replace music with something else. Just for tonight, <laughs> right? It's a chamber something else festival. That's exciting to me. That's exciting right. to me, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's how I teach, uh, and I think I think that's the fourth thing. I think that for me, I'm going to stop teaching when I'm not excited to teach. I'm going to stop anything if I'm not excited by it. There there has to be excitement. There has to be investment. There has to be not just a calling, but a, a pull into it. You know that that motivation that it, that that sense that if I don't teach today or if I don't teach this year, I'm not going to feel as alive. So that, that's the why I'm even, it's not just I don't want to replace the word. I'm excited to replace the word because any other word you use other than music, where are we going to go, right? Uh, a, a, a chamber sonic festival. Ooh, a, a chamber play festival. Oh, you know? <laughs> Sorry. Now I'm, no, no, that's good. Right? You see what I'm saying? Good. Right. I, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. The minute you say I mean, play, by, I think by, video, by yeah. changing it, you investigate different aspects. Of exactly, it. exactly. So that's exciting to me. Yeah, and that's that, that's how I think we learn. That's how I think we learn. By the way, I just said play festival, so I thought of thinking. I started thinking of my son. He's on video games. That's how not only how he plays, but that's how he has community. Mm -hmm, you absolutely. know, it is chamber like. There's never more than maybe five or ten of them. At one no, time. My son so, does that too. You can see, right? <laughs> so that's, that's on us. We got to create the Norfolk Chamber Music Festival app or a video right. game. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Right? Yeah, that yes. would be deep. That would be a yes. way to talk about the history of where that, that shed, that's the music shed, right? Yeah, the music shed. That's right. That is interesting to me. Right. That, there's, there's so many things that, oh, sorry. Okay, let me stop. No, you no, see, it's that's, good. I that's keep exciting. going. I like yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, that's how we, what we, how we learn is just as important as, as, as whom we are learning about. And right. who is teaching that history is just as important as who was a part of it. Right. right. I you, mean, you see yes. what I'm saying? Uh, right? No, if absolutely. I, yes. Right. If I, if I talk about, if I talk about Robin's battle, I'm going to talk about Robin's battle in a certain way. The found, well, you know, I, I'm understanding yeah. the, found, the founder of your festival, yeah. right. That's exciting to me in a way that it will be different maybe even for uh, um, uh, so, uh, someone who is um, related to the battle family or a descendant of the battle family. Yeah, so that's... Right. that's no, I, I mean, I, you know, I love your ideas. I mean, I, so you see, I mean, both of you actually see, yeah. um, you know, graduates... Of, of, of our top music schools. You see them all the time. I mean, that, you know, I guess my question is, you know, um, what is it that should change in the education of these musicians oh. as they as they come out and, and, and be ready to enter whatever new musical landscape there is? I can say that in one word, humble. Be humble. I mean, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm just going for the jugular there. But there's this, <laughs> there's this, there is this gnawing, nagging sense of entitlement. It's not exclusive to Yale. It's exclusive to a generation. I'm just going for it. Sorry, mm -hmm. I'm a little bit late. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's this sense of, you know what it began? Sorry, I, I'm gonna, I really am going to say this succinctly. There's, there was an episode on 60 Minutes where they talked about, even if you lose, you get a trophy. 
You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So you get yeah. a trophy for effort. Okay, I, I, I get that. I, I, that kind of happens with my son. He's 11 years old, but I get it. If Johnny or Mary misses the ball, oh, look how good they did. They tried to kick it. Good job. Here's a trophy. In fact, in this segment, which is really deep, there was a team that lost every game. There was a team that won every game. They got the same trophy. Okay, by the way, there's one company that makes all these trophies. This guy is a multi, multi, multi millionaire. I kid you not. The warehouse expert. That was his idea, probably. That was the right. But, but they, they put a social scientist into this segment, and she talked about this is actually damaging because we, we, you're tr we're training a generation that doesn't know how to fail. They go into a, you have a generation of students who say, I want to be for showing up, I want to be rewarded for effort. That is not the way the world has ever worked, particularly for BIPOC people. You dig? Can you imagine? So I would say humble yourself. Enjoy the work. Enjoy the struggle. Now we are all equal, right? This is a place of, of creativity and captivity. Creativity and captivity. And if you're, forget about the word problem. Substitute problem for opportunity. This is an opportunity for you to graduate from school and to actually do something not for yourself, but for the community, for the world. Let's start there, right? So that, that would be my one thing is that this notion that there's an expectation. We, we have, we have um, what's the word when you, um, we have, uh, uh, what's that word when you combine two things? You know, uh, it's gonna drive me crazy. Juxtaposition, <laughs> kind of, but uh, we, we we have unfortunately confused um, uh, um, success mm -hmm. with access. We mm -hmm. have confused success with entitlement, with expectation, right? So humble yourself. Forget about this notion that I'm supposed to. Well, now, right? This notion that you're going to graduate and get a job and make a lot of money. That's not the way it's ever worked, right? It, it may maybe it worked that way for a few. <laughs> Right, maybe, and, and, and it always will. But let me tell you something. I mean, well, sorry, I want to be succinct. Our president is a very good example of someone who did not understand service, who was not loved, and is not engaging in a in a exchange of empathy. He is a cautionary tale. Yeah, it's good. I love that. I think my small contribution to that, that I, I, I think is very dangerous and, and witnessing this for the generation of our children and our eldest is finishing college. And I think about their generation. To me, these are brilliant people who are so creative and motivated and um, there's so much there, but to me, the most important piece that I worry about often keeps me up at night is uh, there. It's not just as simple as a lack of resilience. It's this need to seek out comfort and need to seek out like culture um, and safe spaces. It's not, I don't anyway want to take away from cohort building and a safe space on an emotional level when you can come in and vent and, and talk about things. But I do want to caution that the moment that we do not allow ourselves to work up enough, enough grit and resilience on a mental level to hear an opposing point of view so as to develop critical thinking, so as to be able to not only defend our position, but also be challenged and at times be okay with not being right and, and being told by an opposing view that there's a way to evolve what you're doing and perhaps learn from it. I think the moment we lose our ability to think critically, to be criticized, to receive and welcome and solicit critical mm. feedback, mm. The, the, that is a moment we also then, we, we rob ourselves of the opportunity to grow and build bridges. If we are, so I actually think it is a, a, a dangerous anti, anti pro to diversity 
the minute we are not comfortable being in a room with folks who aren't like us, who don't think exactly like us, who don't see the world precisely as we do, and when we're uncomfortable confronting that in a way that's maybe driven by curiosity or welcoming all of something that's, that's different, I, I think we stop growing. And we can't stop growing, not now. It's, that's the generation um, that's going to build our future, that's going to defend uh, critical thought, that's going to defend these ideals of freedom and democracy. So I think we have to help that generation find courage and resilience. No, I, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, yeah. uh, let me do an aside. For anyone who wants to ask a question, I think we have, you know, about yeah. 10 minutes. So we'd really like, <laughs> we'd like to hear your questions and talk about your questions. I mean, I, I think what I totally agree with what you said, Afa. I think in some ways, um, you know, you can trace a lot of, you know, um, what's happened in classical music to that. Ad you know, I think that's one reason, you know, why <laughs> yeah. the repertoire you know, we, we keep coming back to the same pieces over and over again, you know, in concerts, right? Because we know those pieces, we feel comfortable with those pieces. Um, yeah. And, you know, what, what we should be doing is, is you know, n not that we, of course, we should love these pieces, but we're, we should also look for sure, other there's, pieces to There's love room too, to love you know? all of them, yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. And by the way, my good friend, Mina Troy, she helped me. The word was conflate. Oh. Ah, yes. we can't. We should not be. Con we we often we are conflating right. graduation with education with vision, mm -hmm. right? And they're right. separate things. You know, I can't. I mean, we all we all have. I think I can't tell you how many incredible, successful graduates of so many great programs don't have vision, or don't even have an education. Or don't have a total education. I mean, I, that's that's part partly the fault of the student, but also partly the fault of the school. Sure, right? the system. Yeah. Sure. Right. Yeah. I, I, I mean, Mel, I know you don't like to talk about it, Melvin, but what are your degrees? I have example? too many degrees that I don't yeah, use. No, no, that's, but, all, that's all I'll say. No, I don't know about that, actually. I don't know. I, I, well, I, I, I think there's artistry in chemistry. Of, yeah, of course. Is that course. fair to say? That's, absolutely. Right? I mean, yeah. just so everyone knows, what are your degrees, brother? Because I'm so fascinated by your... I'm a master's, doctorate, whatever. <laughs> uh, he's not going to go... All right, Come look on. him up, ladies and gentlemen. Look him <laughs> up. Because it's incredible. And I think it's really... But I, I think it is... I think if anything, um, we, 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 you're right. We're too narrow in general. Right. right? We I mean, but, but it's part of, be, it's part yeah. of being comfortable, right? Like yes. once you know something, you know it, right? And you feel comfortable no. in what you know. And yeah. when you don't know something, you feel uncomfortable. So, sure. I mean, so that, I mean, so that's, a, you know, I think that's the basic, you know, feeling yeah. and people don't yeah. like to feel uncomfortable. Yeah, I agree. But, I agree. but, you know, I think, uh, you know, the only way to really learn is to make yourself uncomfortable, right? I think so. For that's a part of prolonged it. period of time, too. That, no, yeah. that's. Really I mean, it should be a. Ha yeah. It should be a habit. To, that's why, you yeah. know, anybody who's good at something will will push themselves all the time to be a little bit more uncomfortable, yeah. you know, so that they well, can. Yeah. Get well, better. it's also right. It's also and it's also what I also like to do is combine words. Almost have. Well, I, call, I talk about this pas de deux, but what words would you combine with education? Or maybe to put it another way, if you thought about words in a contrapuntal fashion, right? What words best support one another? Education, responsibility. Education, imagination. Education, personal responsibility. Education, activism. Art resistance. So these are another, this is another, and that's how I talked with Zachary. I told Zachary long ago, I'm not going to discipline you. I'm not interested in that, right? I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you choices. I'm going to try to redirect your behavior. I'm going to try to give you a sense of right and wrong and choice, but I'm not interested in making you stand in the corner. And I'm certainly not going to put my hands on you. I don't know, we don't have to get too much into it, but I was whipped as a child. <laughs> You know, that's how you learn. And you learn for different times. Right. That's right. That's right. I was whipped and you got fast. You know, that's how you could outrun the belt. But um, no, I wasn't interested in that when, as, when I became a parent. That's part of 
I don't know what evolution or so. It's just a difference. So yeah, I think one way we can start to think about even history is again, I keep I because it's right there. What word would I assign to Norfolk? That's really interesting to me. Mm-hmm. You know, Norfolk and new, you know, um, or old, <laughs> or old, <laughs> yeah. Cor- courageous. Yeah, color, 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 not colored, color, broad. That's it. South. North is too easy. South. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, Sphinx, even that, right? Do you, I, I, I kind of, I don't know. Why Sphinx? Yeah, I was, I was curious Sphinx? about that, actually. Yeah. There's a more eloquent defi- uh, explanation authored by our founder, my dear life partner on our website. The way I tell the story is that it's for a variety of reasons, but, but the pinnacle of achievement that is Sphinx uh, in an architectural and historical sense, we have always found that our mission, the way it's explained to our beneficiaries, our constituents, our community, is most synonymous with achievement and excellence. It's always been so, so important to talk about diversity from the standpoint of an evolved definition of excellence. We cannot be excellent unless we are diverse. So in some ways, it is a tribute to that pinnacle. And in other ways, because it's also an artwork that has withstood the test of time as from the standpoint of uh, the pyramids and an artwork Um, also kind of depicting the fact that it is up to the listener, the beholder, to interpret the art. It may mean different things to you than it may mean to me, and that's okay. Uh, The beauty in that flexibility while also always emphasizing achievement and excellence is is kind of why um, Mm -hmm. the name comes from from Sphinx. And, and of course, it being... uh, uh, source of geographical source of uh, BIPOC people from the continent uh, to which we pay tribute in, yeah. and in an anthological sense. Yeah. yeah. And connected oh, to that, Melvin, I was going to say, so the piece I'm writing on commission from your wonderful festival, can we talk um, about why the fires why the burn? Fires burn. I think that's right. Yes. That's the yeah. yes. I love yeah. that. That's yeah. a great title. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm thinking about Philadelphia tonight as much as I'm thinking about Port-au-Prince, Haiti, as much as I'm thinking about um, rural China, rural China. Um, uh, the, the, the piece will be um, a series of solos, duos, trios, and then ultimately the, the whole group, which is a quartet and a male singer and a, a female the singer. A female singer, right. Right. And... Um, It'll be um, a kind of a catalog of not only these um, kind of uh, this, these um, pas de deux that often end in a lethal intimacy, the lethal intimacy. I also am realizing even in this conversation, Melvin, there has to be one or two stories that talk about life. Um, in the question, um, uh, Jim Nelson talked about the shed being, quote, a fountainhead from which was shed light on culture, music, art, and other matters pertaining to the higher life, end quote. That's something my father would have talked about. He (laughs) talked about how the soul has no color. It's restricted by the body only for a finite period of time. You know, he talked about the astral body. He talked about um, how upon his death, and I lost him, April 22nd, 2013 at 1.07 p.m., how that is what it is for a person of color to be free right? To be able to travel the universes, travel through time. All questions will be answered. That's, that's what I, my immediate reaction to that is higher life, right? What, how, what are the stories that maybe are embedded somewhere in Norfolk's history that should be a part right. of- I mean, I th- you know, I think the thing about, about um, your, your music, Daniel, is that, you know, you, we're talking about very serious, tragic things, right? But I think for you, at the end of it, there's, yeah. there's, it's always hopeful. Yeah, I think. Right. That might I be, mean, you, I yes. mean, in a way, your yeah. music is trying to show a way forward. Um, I, I do feel things. that. I, I've always, I've said for a few years now, when politicians and pundits fail us, artists have always led the way. Art has always led the way. We, we need that now more than ever, right? I, 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 I have a need to follow, but I also understand that as an artist, sometimes I'm called upon to lead. 
And um, how one leads can be generous and broad and empathetic and sharing and caring. So I do. I, I, I think about how, how we turn the mundane into magic as much mm-hmm. as I think about, yes, let's talk about what is happening in Philadelphia right now, but let us also talk about what could be happening in Philadelphia 10 years from now, 100 years from now, 1,000 years from now. Afa, you said it best. Spink, someone, I, I, let me not quote you, but I am paraphrasing something I've often heard you say. When someone asks you, when, when, what, what is, when, when, is, when will Sphinx be most successful, you have often replied, when it's not needed anymore. Is that something along those lines? Absolutely. I've always believed that it would be a blessed day when our work is superfluous yeah. in many ways. When we feel, look, and understand, identify, express like our communities. Mm. And then you don't need to kind of work to restore this balance because you will have achieved some semblance of it. I, we're far away from that reality. Right. I think even even if one achieves it, you, you would always have to constantly maintain it, right? I mean, you can't... You would. You, you can't feel like you've left it at all. You don't have to think about it anymore, but it seems like an active process no matter where you are in it. Very true. You have to be intentional about it. I want that intentionality to be inherent to a set of priorities of our service organizations, our universities, our Ivy League schools, our conservatories. I want that to be everyone's goal, you know, and then right. it won't be it won't be Sphinxes primarily and sometimes exclusively. No, oh, absolutely. And, and, and it's so, you know, I look at the three of us. There was a time, perhaps, when Yale would not want or love us. <laughs> Yet, we represent and have been invited to represent Yale. And that's what is important. That's what's so wonderful and miraculous. And where will Yale and Norfolk be 100 years from now? And how can we start to speak to them? really walk through that wonderful truth. You know, I know we're we're ending, but I I have to remind myself that racism is not just malice, it's malady, right? It's affliction. It is a pandemic. There's degrees Mm -hmm. of it. Some Some people present their racism asymptomatically. They don't even know they have it. Some are full blown racist. And then there's everything else in between. And that's important that we understand if we are going to get to a place where love and respect and equity actually has deep consequential and meaningful roots and i do feel even according to to so many scholars who who have gone through these types of changes in this country something is different in this moment right Mm -hmm. we're on the precipice of something and I'm excited. I'm excited for us, Melvin. I'm excited for let's, us. Let's see what happens next week. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, okay. Yes, yes. Let's see what happens next. That will help. That will absolutely help. That will help depending, you know, depending. Oh, by the way, vote. If you haven't yet, please vote, right? Yes. If you haven't yet, there's still time. Vote. Vote in person if you can. Get it in the mail, FedEx it, whatever it is. But if you can, please vote. This is really important. Every vote counts now more than ever. And that that's an important thing, I think, for all of us to be saying. Yeah. All right. I think um, we're at time. I want to thank you both so much, Daniel and Alpha. Thank you again. Um, your, your time is precious, and I'm grateful that you've chose to uh, give us an hour of it um i know that we'll we'll have further conversations um we'll have further collaborations and i'm i'm excited um to see what daniel and and afa and and norfolk can do together i am too absolutely it's a privilege it really is and thank you melvin and and everyone at norfolk chamber music festival and the yale summer school of music for being so gracious and so welcoming and so supportive and loving in in what is what is um, really important vital and timely work okay thank you again we'll talk soon bye-bye everyone